financial crisis, the mass media maintain a major social institution. The media inform, educate and raise public knowledge about the actions being taken to stop the virus from spreading. Deal with the worst aftermath and the general social perspective of events. These are the well-known social normative functions they fulfill. While medical professionals treated those who had been infected and the Ukrainian soldiers fought back against Russian assaults, media professionals were at the forefront of informing, educating and raising awareness about the potential risks and threats to global health, the economy and the entire ecosystem. Journalist safety has continued to draw international attention due to their constant exposure to social, political, health and economic risks while performing their duties. Report says approximately 2,000 journalists have died in 94 countries due to the coronavirus pandemic since March 2020, but the figure is a low overall estimate. However, because the reason of journalist death is frequently not defined or their death not announced, the actual number of victims is definitely higher. There is no credible information in some countries. After vaccination became available last year, the death toll began to decline. Out of the 1,940 deaths of journalists registered by the Press Emblem campaign since March 2020, 954 were Latin America. Asia followed with a death toll of 556, ahead of Europe at 263, Africa with 98, and North America at 69. The notice noted many instances of journalists being targeted, tortured, kidnapped, attacked and killed, or refused safe passage from towns and regions under siege, according to the UN-appointed independent rights experts, including the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression. According to the latest UN data, seven journalists have been confirmed killed in Ukraine in Ukraine since the Russian invasion on February 24, while others have battled vices such as abuse, sexual violence, cyber attacks, and viewpoint sanctions. The last time so many journalists died in Ukraine was in 2014, when Russia annexed Crimea. Shireen Abu Akleh, an Al Jazeera reporter, was killed while covering an Israeli raid on the Jenin refugee camp in the northern occupied West Bank. Governments around the world, in addition to human rights groups, condemned her killing. Journalists in Nigeria are endangered species as they encounter more and more hazards in the course of their work. According to the European Union, 44 Nigerian journalists were assassinated in 2021. Many more were assaulted, wrongfully imprisoned or disappeared. This is frightening and dangerous because there is no other vocation in Nigeria today that faces such a fate. A Channel's TV reporter, Precious Owolabi, was hit by a stray bullet in Abuja during a violent clash between the members of Shite and police. Mala Mohammad, Danladi Abubakar, FNG, FNG, both AIT correspondents, Maxwell Nashan, famous Joe Barrow, Lawrence Okoji, Ikechiku Onobogu, amongst others, were all killed in active service. AIT Stundia Labi was stopped and questioned by the Ukrainian and Polish army forced to produce his passport as a means of identification while reporting the Russian war in Ukraine. Others were not so lucky. Their death shines a torch on the ever dangerous world of journalism. All right, thank you for taking the time to join us. Very sad reports there about the danger in the job we do as journalists. Just the job of bringing information to our people, what we encounter, and the cost of getting this job done. Lives lost, people incarcerated, colleagues um, seized, some tortured, many across the world, including Nigeria, still in different um, incarceration centers. Turning me uh, to look at some of the dangers and risk uh, journalists face in the course of doing their job, where many have paid the ultimate price. I have two colleagues now joining me. First is Daniel Elumba. Daniel is a practicing lawyer uh, based in London and he is also a journalist and the publisher of Elumba News Online. 
and I'm also joined by Ijoma Idikachima. Ijoma is also a journalist and she is a fellow of the United States Institute of Peace. She is also joining us from the United States. Guys, thank you for taking the time to join us on the program today. Daniel, let me start with you. Uh, share with us some of the experience um, um risky experience journalists face in the course of doing their job i know yourself uh maybe 2000 and um uh, 2017 18 you were also a victim of some of these uh, uh incidences that we're talking about daniel yes uh thank you tunde for inviting me to your program this afternoon from my personal perspective, the dangers journalists face, especially in Nigeria, is from the hands of politicians, political leaders, and the powerful people in the society. And while Nigerian journalists are not much victims of disappearances, killings, as assassinations like we used to have in the case of Delegiwa and a few others, for instance, I think the problem of Nigerian journalists today is more of uh, politicians and powerful people using the instrumentality of the law to either jail them, persecute them, or intimidate them. And my own experience is where we have this uh, Section 24 of the Cyber Crimes Act, which was promulgated under the previous administration of the Lord Jonathan. Uh, on the face of it, it seeks to it seeks to punish people who use the virtual media to incite problems in the society. But then Nigerian politicians and the police are using it to intimidate journalists. And in my own case, I was charged for terrorism, if you will believe that, and infringing on the Cyber Crimes Act in 2018, arrested by the SARS police and the seven other members of my family. Uh, even though I was given a uh, police bail, but uh, my brother and editor in chief was the, remained in detention for like 28 days. And we are charged to court under this cyber crime act. Apart from me, many other journalists have also experienced the same problem. And this, despite the fact that the ECOWAS Human Rights Court have decided that that section 24 of Nigerian Cyber Crimes Act is illegal because it infringes on Article 9 of the African Charter of the Human Rights Act, of the Human Rights, and Article 19 of the ICCPR. But till date, the governments and authorities of Nigeria has continued to use this act and law to intimidate journalists. Under that legal instrument Nigerian authorities use to intimidate and punish journalists is the suing them for uh, defamation their personalities in my own experience as well right now the governor of the cardinal state manasse um, erufai is suing me and some other people including professor dinkalo for publishing an item that has factual basis actually but i think his problem is that he presumably believe it brought him into the circuit but it's a fact so and when they sue you like that my com my media right now has about five cases in court suing us for defam for defamatory material. And when you look at it, they don't they do not believe that they will win in court. But imagine you are a Nigerian news media, have five civil court cases going against you. How would you pay your lawyers? So they try to intimidate you to stop you from publishing things that are half factual business, but they feel that maybe it demeans their office. And many other journalists have experienced that as well, detention, jail, punishment, and they seek actually to you know, stop you from doing your job. And that, another thing I'll have to mention quickly, briefly, is the issue of security. At the last month, again, you know, banditry, kidnapping is everywhere. And so when they see you online, they probably believe that you have a lot of money. Last month, my editor-in-chief was arrested in Abuja, for instance, two weeks ago. And then we have to pay ransom to get him released. So at least uh, Nigerian journalists are operating in a very harsh, hostile environment from the environment I get around them, from politicians, and from powerful individuals in the society. 
All right, Dana, thanks a lot. What, what some very terrible experience yourself, your family and colleagues have had trying to get the job you do uh, done uh, out there despite being based in the UK. Uh, you suffer some intimidation every time you come into the country. Uh, Ijoma, let me, let me come to you. I mean, you, you, you are a fellow United States Institute of Peace for your works and other things that you have done. Share with us uh, s some of the terrible risk involved some of the risk involved as a journalist working uh, uh trying to get information across to people we are aware of the sharing incident the united states the israel issue um we are also aware some of the incidences involved uh, uh when reporters try to cover um uh, um airplanes in the war front uh my case i was stopped while i was trying to cover the issue of ukraine russian war i was forced to produce my international passport uh share with us some of these issues and experience uh, that we are can't in the course of getting information out to to up uh, to the public Ijoma. Okay, so um, thank you, um, Mr. Labi. Um, so to start with, when we look at who a journalist is, um, a journalist is simply trying to inform the public using text, audio, video formats to be able to disseminate this information to the public. And I'm going to be talking from a different perspective, which is the armed conflict um front the situations where journalists have to report from the front line now it comes with a lot of unpredictable conditions of war for mm. war correspondents and media crew members and some of the challenges that this um, journalist face even recently in the year 2022 as we've seen is getting killed they've also been in the past been kidnapped and used as um, a uh, like a bait for ransom or prisoner exchange from the gender perspective we see um female reporters who get of course that's underreported in cases of rape and um sexual harassment they're violently attacked they are threatened and even journalists in the conflict um situations face lack of basic physical needs and also their protective equipment these are things that globally that they encounter. There's also a challenge of data security. Um, Daniel talked about cyber um, security and all of that. It actually um, is a risk for journalists who is out there trying to cover and gather information to disseminate to the public. You worry about inscription and how your data is safe. Now, very important is health and stress management. The truth is we see the reports, the, the, the news, the war, the images from the eyes and the lens of the journalist. This tells mm. us that the journalist who is physically at that place sees so much more that we do not see. And so it also has a mental health stressor and traumatic experience that they go through, even though it's not being um, reported. Now, um, there's also this bias of, um, towards violence and violent groups that's being covered. And... I've also had cases where um, I read about where um, journalists end up um, being used as um, objects of attack. And in these cases, you find where two warring countries get frustrated at some point and they decide to pour their frustration on the journalists, especially when you have independent journalists who are not allowed to report factual information the way it's being um, told. And just to say the last point, recently, with the advancement of technology and also social media, one risk um, traditional war correspondents face is um, the media war, where we have to deal with fake news, propaganda, as opposed to actually being able to disseminate the real information out there to the public. Even though there's an international humanitarian law that protects um, journalists and um, gives them immunity when they're in war zones, it's really rarely been adhered to because recent reports from the reporters, the 2022 report from the Reporters Without Borders shows us several reports where media crews are being targeted, where they sustain gunshot injury, even in the current Ukraine and Russia war. We see images of that. So this is, um, it's, it's just so much more that's happening right now that I believe that journalists should not be seen as the enemies in war because co countries definitely conduct their security screening and background checks before war correspondents are being allowed into the countries and so they shouldn't become um objects of attack they should be protected and their safety it's really necessary and of importance that we start talking about that like we see in the case of the Algeria um journalist that recently died from um being um she was shot in the head 
for me that debt is it's prohibited and according to the geneva convention it is a war war crime against humanity and it shouldn't happen at all there's no justification for journalists who are being attacked in the line of their duty because they are actually there on assignments not for personal fun not for personal reasons but because they need to disseminate information that's what we call mass communication mass media thank mm. you all right some points you raised there but dana let me let me come back to you um Ajo Ma did say that uh, journalists should not be seen as enemy in wartime what about they being seen as enemy even in peacetime why why do governments why do people that feel offended by what journalists put out feel offended why do they consider them as enemy and probably made them a target well in some societies for instance if you take the united states as an example the press is taken as a very important part of the government and yet, even in some of those areas, their position in the society is very well recognized. And the constitution of the United States gives them a special place. And then we know that the, in Nigeria, again, the constitution of Nigeria also recognizes the importance of the press in the society. It was the only profession, I think, that was expressly recognized in the constitution as the fourth extent of the ring, and their rights is very well protected. And yet, despite that, someone has just pointed out that no matter how well a constitution is written, much depends on the people who practice it, the practitioners. It's, it's um, saddening to see that despite this important role being played by journalists and the press, the authorities still see them sometimes as enemies rather than seeing them as partners in the art of governance. Take, for instance, the same government would like the media to let the public know what they are doing. And then imagine if the press is not there to inform, educate, and enlighten the public. How do you think the will of governance will turn? Obviously not. I think what happens in the case of Nigeria is simply that these public officials will not want to be held to account, to be held to account. They will not want their actions to be scrutinized. They will not want their offices to be, for light to be shown in what they are doing. Of course, they recognize that the media is important. Of course, they recognize that the press is important. Of course, they recognize the importance of journalism to the society. But the problem is they will not want their activities to be scrutinized and held to account and be told, look here, what you are doing is quite wrong. And that is why some of them are afraid of the press. And that is why some of them are afraid of the journalists. I made reference to section 24 of this Cyber Crime Act. If you look at it on the face of it, it's simply trying to stop people from using the virtual world to commit crimes, to abuse children, or to incite the society to engage in terrorist acts. But what happens in Nigeria is, and the police is now they see this as a tool to use it against the against the journalists who are going about their lawful duty. And of course, they know that I haven't seen it's difficult for any court to convict a journalist, uh, an online journalist, using this Section 24. So they know they will not win, like I said. But at the end of the day, they feel that by hauling these journalists to the court, by detaining them for, say, 30 days, two months, or even one week, by taking them to court all the time, suing them from, for defamation and libel and all what they know they will not win in court. But they are hoping that by punishing them. And sometimes they win. In 2014, the Online Publishers Association, Association of Nigeria organized a seminar for practicing journalists in Nigeria. It's meant to be a capacity building workshop. And I remember very well, a very well-known 
Nigerian social media influencer, one of the most successful blog in the country. When, while addressing the while addressing my our fellow online journalists, he made one important fact. He said, look, if you want to succeed in Nigeria, don't talk about the politicians. Leave government alone. Concentrate on music, celebrity, what people would like to hear, and then simply make your money. Because when you talk about politicians, you get into trouble. And so people who are there, I was like, I won't interrupt them, but well, I'm one of the organizers. So I said, okay, well, say your piece. So you see, Nigerian journalists are getting intimidated. Even up till now, I told someone in Nigeria I'm about to come into this program. He said, Daniel, be careful. Do you remember what happened to you in 2018? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> politicians believe that by intimidating journalists, they will stop them from holding them to account. And they are succeeding in a place in a place like Nigeria where people, will, you know, well, if they stop you from doing your job, how will you take care of your family? So to protect yourself and protect the means of livelihood, simply shut up your mouth. Thank you, Daniel. It is very dangerous for society. A very indeed dangerous society where people are now finding it difficult to do their job. I remember when you called me that we you had security men numbering about twenty five who jumped the fence of your house into your building, all wearing black at about two a.m. Or because they wanted to come and arrest a journalist two a.m. in the dead of the night <laughs> to arrest a journalist and they jumped the fence. How have you been able to overcome that experience? <laughs> yeah. um, well, <laughs> it's very, it's very traumatic, especially for my children. I remember my son because um, I traveled to Nigeria with my family then, and they had to come back without me because I, I was my bad condition is that I will not leave Abuja. Then my son was in school telling the what happened in primary school, telling the headmistress what happened to me. He said that um, <laughs> that kidnap kidnappers came in the night and took me away, and it was like. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> <laughs> because he couldn't believe they had the police. So he said kidnappers came to my came to our house, jumped the fence and took I took daddy away. So Unfortunately you were you were, were on holidays in Nigeria at the time. time. Unfortunately, you were on holidays in Nigeria at the time and you brought in your kids who are not even used to the Nigerian system. So they would never <laughs> believe they were policemen. They saw them as kidnappers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Daniel, thanks a lot. Let me quickly go back to Ijoma for our last words on the program. Ijoma, what is the way forward? How can we do our job without being intimidated and without facing the risk of death in one minute? Okay, so one, we know that the media plays a vital role as a guardian of our democracy. The truth is we have existing laws, but those laws do not provide enough protection because most times the laws are being violated. So if we must have a way forward, then we have to make our policy leaders and government officials accountable to be able to keep that law. That's also where the judicial arm of the government comes into play to ensure that the right, human rights of journalists are being protected and ensure that they have that immunity that they deserve. Now, as a government, of course, we know that journalists are seen as, um, they should be regarded as civilians and not as enemies in doing their assignment. So as a government, um, as a police officer, as um, whoever you are within a law enforcement um, agency, if you cannot protect the lives of journalists and as civilians, then you've actually failed in your line of duty because you are being entrusted to be able to protect their lives and ensure that they do their job. As journalists, we do our jobs with um, factually without being media biased and reporting from a biased perspective. That's right. my own. Th th thanks that's my a own. lot. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Ijoma Idikachuma, a fellow of the United States Institute of Peace and who is currently running a research program in the United States of America. Thank you for your time on the show today. And of course, Daniel thank Elomba, you. thank you for your time uh, on the show today. I hope you've been able to make a difference to your children, the difference between kidnappers and security officials in Nigeria that jumped the office at 2 a.m. that they are not real they were not kidnappers they were policemen <laughs> all right thank you daniel thank you for taking your time to join us on the program thank you, uh, i'd like to dedicate thank this you. program
to all Thank our colleagues much. around the world who have lost their lives in the line of doing this job. Uh, Shirin Abu, uh, the Al Jazeera journalist killed by an Israeli sniper, and many other people uh, killed in the Russian Ukraine war, and even here in Nigeria, the Channel reporter killed there in Abuja. Many of my colleagues in IIT who have also lost his job trying to get um, trying to get a report out to our viewers uh, uh, dedicated this uh, uh, program to them. I don't know when mine will come, but I just hope that the government will continue to protect us. My name is Tunde Labi. Sincere precision to everyone that's made this. My colleagues who've made this program possible. It's another weekend. Enjoy it. Bye.